Anyway, it is a great pleasure that I'm here today to introduce our next session. I'm sure for many of you who've worked in global organizations and had to look at US and EU privacy issues, often there appears to be a lot of differences between the two regimes. But our next session will be examining this in a bit more detail and exploring the commonalities and differences in the US and EU approach. How much conflict is there really? And we have an expert keynote panelist for you this morning. First of all, representing the US, delighted to introduce Julie Brill, who is the Commissioner for the Federal Trade Commission. Commissioner Brill has been with the FTC since 2010 and has ex extensive experience on privacy and particularly on the consumer protection side. Prior to her current role, she was with the Senior Deputy Attorney General, Chief of Consumer Protection Antitrust at the North Carolina Department of Justice, a lecturer at Columbia University School of Law, Assistant Attorney General for Consumer Protection Antitrust for the State of Vermont for over 20 years. Numerous awards for protecting consumers, written numerous articles, and served on a number of expert panels. So eminently experienced to represent the US today. Our second speaker representing the EU, delighted to present Isabel Falca Peretin, who is the chairwoman of the Keneal and Article 29 Working Party. Madame Falca Peretin has been a member of the Keneal since 2004 became chair in 2011, re-elected 2014, and was elected the chair of the Article 29 Working Party February of this year. Again, has numerous experience in privacy, technology, expert advisor for the OECD, chair of the advisory board and general delegate of the F French Internet Right Forum. So again, eminently suitable to represent the EU in our debate this morning. And finally, our referee, or should I say moderator for this, I'm sure, very candid debate, is Yeti Telemann, who is a partner at Covington and Burling LLP in Brussels. Uh, Yeti is co-chair of the firm's privacy practice, and she's been selected to join the European Commission on the expert team on privacy. She advises all aspects of EU DP and security, regular speaker on privacy, and she has law degrees from both Belgium and the US, so linking our two speakers. So once again, I'd like to welcome our keynote panel, what I'm assured is going to be a candid and interesting debate on the commonalities and differences between the US and EU. Welcome our panelists, thank you. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, everybody. This is a well-packed room. I even see some people sitting on the steps there, so we hope this will be a good panel and that it's worthwhile sitting on those steps. Commonalities and differences between the US and the EU approach to data protection. What are we? Are we just in the US and the EU? Are we just very far cousins who see each other once or twice a year? Or are we brothers and sisters, but we haven't quite realized it yet? Well, the purpose of this panel is to find the question, the answer to that question. But we're not gonna find the answer for you. You're gonna have to find the answer yourself. And those two distinguished ladies sitting here with me on the, on the stage here, they're gonna help you find the answers. Commissioner Brill, the FTC, uh, Madame Falke Pierreton, of the CNIL and the chairwoman of the Article 29 Working Party, I can't think of two more distinguished and more appropriate people to be sitting here and to help you answer that question. And the way we, we, we thought we would be doing this is we would take a number of topics, topics that are very much alive on both sides of the ocean, and see how they're being dealt with on both sides of the ocean, and see whether they're miles apart, the east and the west and the two shall never meet, or whether they're actually a lot closer than we all think. Right, now we have only 40 minutes and some of them are already gone, so let's dive straight into it. First topic that we would use as an example is big data. Very much alive on both sides of the ocean. And if I can start with you, Commissioner Brill, 
There's been a lot of activity in the United States on big data recently. You have the White House who recently uh, uh, released a report. You have the FTC who organized a very interesting workshop. And my question to you is, can you give us a flavor of what went on there, uh, what the latest thinking is? And I would be especially interested, and I imagine the audience would be especially interested, to see whether we're moving away in the United States from the traditional notice and consent form, whether we go to a control of use that's being made of data rather than a control at the point of collection. Is there some, is there some movement there? Where, where is this heading? So thank you, Yeti. And let me just say thank you so much to the IAPP for inviting us to come speak. The IAPP is an incredibly important organization, and I think that what they do, what's evidenced here, is they bring together people who really care about privacy. We may not always agree on um, uh, you know, what it is that regulators are doing, but the conversation is so deeply important, and so thank you to Trevor, thank you to Omer, thank you to Mindy and everyone else at the IAPP who does such a fabulous job <coughs> organizing these conferences. Okay, big data. Um, well, actually, let me give a cheat sheet answer to your big question and the question that Sue posed. Cheat sheet answer, you know, I actually think that our commonalities are much, much greater than our differences. I do think there are differences because we have different systems and different laws, but I think there is a tremendous amount that is shared between the United States and Europe. So diving into those issues, um, big data. So the White House began its um, effort uh, 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 almost a year ago, um, but it came out of the Snowden revelations. And the president announced that he wanted to re-examine the ways in which information was being used, not only on the government side, but also on the commercial side. And uh, began a big data a series of workshops and came out with a report. Independently, because we are an independent agency, the FTC began looking at big data issues, and that grew out separately, not so much out of the Snowden revelations, but out of our 2012 privacy report where we did a big rethink about the way in which privacy ought to be thought of in the United States. And it also grew out of a data broker workshop, a data broker workshop and report that we did, IoT, um, Internet of Things workshop. We've been doing a lot of thinking um, and having a lot of workshops and doing a lot of reports around, around big data issues. So some of the things that we have been thinking about, big data does have huge potential benefits for society. You know, and this is reflected in the White House report, but also in our data broker report. Whether it's healthcare, whether it's transportation, whether it's use of resources, energy resources, or education, there are huge potential benefits. But we also see some risks with respect to big data. Data security, we just heard from Miko a tremendous amount about data, data security. Internet of Things and big data also present uh, data security issues. When we have a collect it all now and maybe think about potential uses later, to me, first and foremost, that raises data security issues. Collection of health and other sensitive information, <coughs> or the creation of health or other sensitive information. These are also of concerns, and we need to be thinking about what are the appropriate mechanisms for informing consumers and being transparent around collection and creation of health information. And one of the things that we are beginning to speak about in the United States, and one of the things that our workshop on big data, whether it's a tool for inclusion or exclusion, one of the things we're thinking about is the potential for discriminatory and unfair use of big data. So the challenges are real. I mean, when it comes to big data, the challenges around transparency and choice mechanisms and providing appropriate no notice to consumers, it is a challenge. I mean, especially in the Internet of Things where you have devices that may not have a user interface. But this doesn't mean that notice and choice goes away. From my perspective, and I think from the perspective of the Commission as a whole, we need to be thinking about how notice, choice, transparency ought to, be, um, ought to come to fruition in the world of big data and in the world of Internet of Things. Not whether they apply, but how they apply. So, trans and the other thing I would say is transparency is an incredibly important issue with respect to 
consumer trust. To the extent that we really do want a big data world, and to the extent that we really do want to see these potential benefits come to fruition, we need to ensure that consumers trust the system. And the way that that's going to happen is by transparency and a providing appropriate notice and choice in, in the right circumstances. <coughs> so the analogy that I like to use is an automobile analogy. We need to give tools to consumers on the dashboard. We need to give them notice and choice when appropriate. We talk about the context of the transaction. If we're within a context of the transaction, maybe notice and choice needs to, can be a little bit lesser because it's part of the overall transaction. But when you're talking about collection and use that's completely outside of the context of the transaction, that's when we talk about needing to provide more notice and information and transparency to consumers. Um, so I think about this in, in the automobile term, terms. Um, providing information on a dashboard when appropriate, but also companies need to be looking under the hood, that is, engaging in privacy by design, really examining what they're doing, as well as providing um, uh, information to consumers on the dashboard. One of the things that people are talking about a lot in the United States, and I think here, are use frameworks, risk-based frameworks, when it comes to uh, big data. Very important discussion. I think there is a very imp important role for use-based frameworks and risk-based frameworks, but it can't be the end of the conversation. It's part of, what, of an overall approach to privacy in this new world, but I don't think that it can be the end of the conversation. Again, security issues come into play. Um, and also, when you talk about what's an appropriate use, I think that you need to bring the public into that conversation. In other words, if it's just the companies deciding what an appropriate use is or what risk is, I don't know that the choices will necessarily always be the best. Sunshine is a very important element here. So I think that one of the big questions is, who is going to decide what an appropriate use is? Who's going to decide what appropriate risk is in those kinds of frameworks? Again, being a part of an overall framework. There, again, I think the public really needs to be a part of it. And very, very briefly, an important role for um, anonymization, de-identification. Um, we talk in the, at the FTC about using the ro most robust tools possible for technical de-identification. But we all know that it won't be a silver bullet. There will always be the potential for re-identification. So we want to couple de-identification and anonymization with social contracts. That is, the company that says, we're going to de-identify, we're going to anonymize, will also make a promise that it won't re-identify the data. And anyone that it provides the information to, they will ensure that that company does not seek to re-identify the data. And in that circumstance, again, the amount of consumer trust that will be engendered by any big data project from information that is de-identified in that way, I think will be enormous. So those, those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about in order to bring to fruition the benefits of big data and yet have appropriate tools in place to protect privacy and security. Okay. Madam Falke Pierrot, does this sound like this comes from another planet or does it sound very familiar to you? <laughs> well, <clears throat> it doesn't come from another planet and I'm glad to be here today to have I don't know if, it, if it's a candid conversation or a pragmatic conversation, but I'm happy to be here and share ideas today. Um, a few reactions towards what Julie just said. Um, first, I think we share the idea in Europe and at the Working Party 29 level specifically, we share the idea that um, Big data is just not only a new way to process data. This is a real, I would say, historical breakthrough. In other words, it's a new step in the digital age. And I would call it a, ste a step in which the data becomes a little bit ambient, you see. The data is everywhere, carried by any types of device, the telephone, the sensors, the body sensors, the electrical sensors, the CCTV, everything is big data. So I think we share the conviction with the Podesta report that we are facing something that is really different. 
Second thing I think we're sharing is that it brings a huge amount of benefits. And Julie mentioned some of these new services brought through big data. So there is no difference between us. Third point, of course, we share also the concerns, if not the risks, but the concerns. Discrimination, obviously. Another concern maybe is about the role of the algorithm. Because big data is based on algorithm. How does it work, these algorithms? Are they transparent? Do they know what's behind, what logics are behind the, the algorithm? This is probably one of the subjects. But generally speaking, what we fear about big data is that the person, the individual, won't be in control of this big data. So in the statement the Working Party 29 issued, we said the individual, they have to stay in control, they have to be able to make informative choice towards big data uh, applications. So uh, does it mean we have to review our principles? That was your question. To what we have as an experience in Europe, the answer from the G29, from the Working Party 29 is no. No, because we don't have proof, evidence, that our principles are no longer valid. On the contrary, in each of our countries, we are already working on big data applications using our principles. So they are definitely efficient. And I would say that on the contrary, if we were to change our principle, and there are ideas around this direction, for instance, and Julie mentioned it, the risk-based approach, we would be maybe a little bit afraid because we believe that uh, the risk-based approach is a very interesting approach to measure the allocation of resources of DPA, of data controllers, to proportionate uh, accountability obligations. All of that can be linked to the risk-based approach. But the rights of the data subjects, how can they be linked to the risk-based approach and specifically, if the risk is assessed by the data controller, you have the right or you don't have the right. It's not related to the risk. So, as a conclusion to your question, we believe that big data is a dramatic new step for the digital age, that it doesn't push us every, all of us to review our principles. Of course, we have to develop uh, innovative thinking for anonymization, for market marketing efforts, for transparencies. Of course, we have to work on that. But the principles of our EU legal framework are still valid, we believe it. Thank you. I hope you're all keeping score. Common, different, I'm keeping my score, so. <laughs> Right, second one, bridge incidents. Unfortunately, most of you in the room during your professional life, you're gonna have one. You're gonna have a bridge incident and you're gonna have to go to your regulator. Now, Madame falke pierrotin in Europe, contrary to the United States, we don't have a uniform breach law. We have some member states, very few actually, who have a breach notification law, but, ob but obviously we all know that in the draft regulation, it's very much in there and it's very broad, uh, very low threshold, very short <coughs> period to, um, uh, to come to the regulator. And I would, be interested, um, I would be interested in two things, actually. One is, it strikes me that this is an area where the United States is actually far ahead of Europe. You have had breach laws for you know, decades. So is Europe looking to the states, sort of saying, those are mistakes that were made over there, we're not gonna make the same mistakes, we'll make our own mistakes, but not, at least not those. And I'm losing my papers here. Um, that's my first question. Are we looking at, uh, at the states here in Europe? And second is, 
how are the DPAs preparing for this? This is going to be an avalanche of, uh, of notifications. Um, very complicated, could be cybersecurity, could be malware, could be simple human error, uh, could be forensics. Uh, is there manpower within DPAs to do this? Is there knowledge, technical knowledge within DPAs? I'd be interested in your views. Yeah, this is uh, also a very uh, key question because, for instance, at the CNIL level, in most of our investigation, we notice that there is a, a data uh, security issue and that there is I would say a sort of lack of security culture mm -hmm. within the data controllers. So of course we are very much interested by the American example that is a little bit ahead um, compared to us in um, the means to cope this uh, data security issue. Um, it's not entirely true what you said. We have the uniform uh, legislation that was passed in 2009 and that has started to be implemented in the European countries. In France, for instance, it's in 2011 that we have introduced the data notification in our law. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a bit too early to have, um, I would say, a general conclusion on the efficiency of this notification within Europe. But what we could say is that uh, from the, uh, at least the French example and some others, Interesting comments. First, we haven't been floated by hmm. notification. And it's not exactly what we expected. Second, um, generally, the notification are a bit late compared to the obligation of the law. Third, um, these notification, they help the data controller, and I'm sure uh, Julie will uh, agree, to structure the internal, internal procedure for the security issue. So pedagogically, it's very helpful for the data controller. But it's true that this legislation yet is not really well understood by the European data controller. And in France, for instance, we've had to make a meeting with them to re-explain the legislation in order for them to understand it. So for the G29, we have issued recently um, an advice, an opinion, giving to the data controllers some examples of good practices. Good practices, for instance, to be exempt for notification to the data subjects. So there is a huge um, debate and reflection about this legislation. I think it's a good legislation, and I would say it's not a good legislation which aims at uh, pointing out the data controllers that has committed uh, a mistake. The, the, for us, uh, the main interest of this um, legislation is to structure the information flows and the security culture uh, within the data controllers and to help, I would say, the maturity of the issue to raise. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes time. It was not in our habits. But I'm sure by the end, it's going to be very efficient. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Brill, does this sound familiar to you or do you say, oh, no, we do it completely differently? It, 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 well, um, we, we do it in a way that uh, Many people in the United States don't understand um, even, but, but actually uh, the uh, principle behind it um, is precisely uh, as Isabel articulated, which is that um, the idea behind breach notification, it is to inform consumers, so especially if it involves their credit card or whatever, that they can take steps to try to protect themselves against identity theft. However, another very important principle behind the breach notification laws is to instill a culture of data security and to basically tie uh, the company's reputation to data security. And it, this has been going on now for over 10 years in the United States. California was the first state to adopt a breach notification law. And the reason I said it was complicated how it's done is the breach notification laws are actually at the state level. 
Uh, there are 47 states that now have a breach notification law. So essentially, it is more or less universal in the United States, but at the state level. With respect to the underlying data security, that is, what was happening with respect to the breach and whether or not a company had engaged in, as we term it at the Federal Trade Commission, unreasonable security practices, mm -hmm. that is something that we examine at the federal level at the FTC. But it is, the principle behind it is precisely as Isabel articulated, which is um, to tie the company's reputation to data security. How are we doing in the United States? We still have a ways to go as well in terms of instilling a security culture. I can't say whether we're ahead or behind European uh, companies, but I do think, for instance, most of the people in this audience get it. They completely get it. Where we're working to reach are the, um, the long tail of, say, for instance, the app community, or the long tail of other service providers, that is, entities that may not be able to send representatives to a, to a conference like this or may not be represented by attorneys who can come to a conference like this, but you know the traditional sort of two guys or two gals in a garage. We've got to instill in them the same security culture because size of a company does <coughs> not correlate to sensitivity it's and true. importance of the data. So it's very important for, from our perspective to try to instill this security culture everywhere. But I thought it might be interesting for folks to hear a little bit, um, too, you know, about how we do it at the FTC. So there's breach notification, and then there's examining the underlying security. The Federal Trade Commission looks at that through our, our FTC Act. Um, we have brought to date um, a, over like 40, 50 cases. If you suffer a breach, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to um, bring an enforcement action. And conversely, even if you don't suffer a breach, we still might bring an enforcement action if we find that you um, did not have reasonable security practices that could lead to a clear vulnerability and, the, and a clear potential for a data security problem. So you'll see cases that fall into both categories. Will we have federal legislation? Um, you know, again, the I'm just... The dollar question. Right. <coughs> um, the Federal Trade Commission, which is a bipartisan independent commission, has unanimously called for federal legislation. Um, I, as one of the five members of the commission, do believe there should be um, a strong federal legislation. And if there's strong legislation for breach notification, then I'd be okay with preemption. But I don't think there should be preemption of all the state laws unless the breach notification portion of this law is strong. That is, robust notification to consumers. On the issue of data security, as opposed to the breach notification, I think there the argument for preemption is more um, significant and, and ought to be paid more attention to. I don't see how companies could have different security systems. One mm -hmm. for California, one for North Carolina, one for Montana. <coughs> it, I just don't know how that works. So again, I think that the law should be a strong one, and I'm very hopeful that it will pass, because I do, look, we're doing a good job at the FTC on data security, but we could use a few more tools uh, in our uh, toolbox in order to improve and further instill the culture that Isabel was talking about, whether it's through rulemaking authority or civil, pe civil money penalty authority or, or additional tools, I think that that would be helpful in this area. Thank you. Let's make this a little bit more difficult for our ladies here. I've been thinking loud and hard um, uh, <coughs> to find something that I think is typical European, and I think I found it, the right to be forgotten. So let's not forget the right to be forgotten. Madame Falke Pirotin, where are we on the right to be forgotten? <laughs> You can have your drink first if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's better for my voice. <laughs> Sorry. Um, where are we? Exactly. Good start. Um, we have a decision of the European Court of Justice mm -hmm. that is a very crucial decision. And I think this decision, it's not only dedicated and directed to Europe. It's a decision that is addressed, I would say, not to the entire world, but at least to the privacy community as a whole. And it says first, and this is very important, that 
privacy is a fundamental right. And I think it's important that the highest judiciary level in Europe has said repeatedly and again, privacy is a fundamental right. Second, um, technically, the decision is not so new because, I mean, the right to erase, the right to oppose, we knew these rights in the directive and the editors, the bloggers, I mean, it was already applied by the DPA within Europe. What is new is that the search engine are now considered by the court and so by the regulators as data controllers. So they have to apply these rights. Having said that, um, it's true that the decision of the court has risen enormous social expectations within Europe. And you probably have the figures from Google, but it's more than 100,000 demands towards Google to delist content. What does it mean to us, privacy community? It means that people, they want somehow to control their digital life. And it's a new way that is offered to them complementary to go directly to the editor, primary editor of website, for instance, to control this digital life. So it's, we have to listen to that. So uh, what the G29 has done since then, of course what we want is to have a kind of a harmonized application of this decision within Europe. Why do we want that? Not to exist, but because we want the data subjects, wherever they are in Europe, to benefit from the same protection. So we constituted very quickly after the decision of the court uh, working group, in order for first to cope with the first complaints we had. And there had been complaints all over Europe from the on the decision, the first decision of Google, because we know that roughly half of the demands have been accepted and so delisted by Google. And so the decision of Google are under the control of the regulators, the Privacy Protection Authority, or the judge. So in all of European countries, we have had, we have received complaints. So we have constituted this working group to coordinate ourselves to deal, to assess the complaints. We have elaborated a kind of dashboard in order to segment and to, to map the different complaints we were receiving. And what we are trying to do now is from these uh, ingredients, practical ingredients, to be able and I hope next week we will be able to do it, to issue guidelines, common guidelines, which means first, common criteria throughout Europe. On what criteria do we decide that Google has made the right or the wrong decision? Is it a public figure? Is it a minor? Is it an accurate information? I mean, we can figure out what kind of criteria, criteria could be on the list. It's already the practice of the DPA. It's also probably related to the, to the decision of the courts. So common criteria. And second document that we try to elaborate is a document that would, be, that would explain how this right to be delisted is going to work which data subjects can benefit from uh, this right? For instance, uh, a Chinese in Hong Kong is allowed to ask for the listing. And um, what, is the, what will be the territorial effect of the delisting decision? Is it only limited to Europe? Is it a worldwide decision, depending on how the treatment is organized? You see, there are a lot of different technical aspects that we have to deal with, and the idea is to 
have at the European level a common approach. And I think it's uh, very important because again, we believe that it's not a technical subject for technicians. It's a subject for the life of every, every, everyday life of everyone. So we definitely as DPA need to bring um, simple, understandable and common answer within uh, Europe. So next week we're going to have uh, our plenary session at the Working Party 29 and I hope we'll be able to provide you with uh, these common guidelines. We are looking forward to them. Commissioner Bull, are you going to prove me wrong that this is a typical European thing? Is there such a thing in the United States? Well, uh, needless to say, as everybody knows, the ECJ decision was um, quite controversial in the United States. There were a lot of um, First Amendment advocates who read this as a slap in the face to the First Amendment generally. Um, I don't want to take a, a lot of time because this is a very uh, subtle and complicated issue with respect to the United States in my view. I did give a speech about this in Vienna um, a couple of months ago. So the short answer is I think that there are elements in U.S. law and in U.S. tradition as well as in what the FTC has called for to be implemented in the United States that reflect a right of deletion and or the, the concerns around a right of deletion or right of erasure. I don't think we would use the terminology right to be forgotten. Um, I worry that that's actually somewhat of a misnomer or potentially misleading because I don't think it really is a right to be forgotten. It, it, but I think as Isabel mentioned, you know, these concepts of right of deletion and right of erasure have been around for a while. In the United States, it's more targeted. Um, you know, it exists in the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Consumers have the right to have information removed from their credit report if it's old or if it's inaccurate. And they have the right to review their credit reports for accuracy. We have called for people search firms, that is entities that perform a similar function to what was going on in the ECJ decision, the underlying facts, similar but not identical. <coughs> We've called for those firms to give consumers the ability to opt out or to uh, erase their information. So there are elements of this that either exist in US law now or that exist in our thinking. Oh, and the, the face, our Facebook consent order requires this, that social network to provide a right of deletion for uh, consumers in certain circumstances. So we do have these concepts. One of the things that I have called for in my speech um, and, and elsewhere is clearly Europe is working through these issues. I mean, as Isabel just said, and they are complicated issues. You know, the ECJ, just like the Supreme Court decisions under the Fourth Amendment, they've got a set of facts in front of them and they render a decision. How those set of facts now play out in other circumstances is something that needs to be determined over time. I do think one of the big questions will be the territorial reach, and I think that there are some serious things to think about in terms of whether the European decision should have worldwide effect or not. I think that could raise some uh, potential concerns, real, real concerns in the United States. But in the meantime, I think we need to play out, we need to see how this plays out, just as we would any Supreme Court decision under the Fourth Amendment. I was afraid the commission was going to prove me wrong and she didn't disappoint me. She did prove me wrong, so. Well, not entirely. Not entirely. Um, we have uh, exactly four and a half minutes left to tackle an enormous subject called international data transfers. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, uh, so I'll start to speak very, very fast. It's, um, it's the subject where I think in a most visible way there is an, an honest, attempt by uh, various countries, various continents, to try to come to global solutions. Um, BCRs, uh, CBPRs, the APAC uh, regime, uh, the referential, magnificent step forward, if you ask me. Uh, Madame Falk, where are we on this? No, I think I agree. It's a magnificent step to bridge two different legal systems in a very uh, operational way. And so the idea is to now, once we have elaborated the referential, is to 
test if it works. So a working group has been uh, um, created and uh, we have uh, champions, three companies that have accepted to test the referential. Uh, two of them are already BCR compliant and one is, uh, no, two are uh, CBPR compliant and one is BCR compliant and they are going to commit to the other certification. So um, we're going to see how it works. We're going to have uh, case studies, I guess, and um, we will see what we can do beyond. And what we can do beyond is um, to provide the companies with a common certification, um, how, do you, how would you call that? Um, leaflet or practical tools. It's a bit probably too early now to see if it's possible really to, from the refer re referential to provide the international companies with practical tools, but it's exactly what we are aiming at doing with our uh, champions, with three champions. Wonderful. <laughs> I think uh, this will be of great interest to the companies. Commissioner Brill, the safe harbor. I couldn't close this without mentioning the safe harbor. Um, are we on the same line or is this the East and the West and the two shall never meet? You have the last word on this. I am deeply hopeful uh, that we will um, come to an appropriate uh, conclusion to the safe harbor discussions. Um, look, I, I understand that in Europe the safe harbor has been of deep concern since the Snowden revelations and since um, many people are thinking about not only uh, how government is using data, but also the role of commercial entities in terms of uh, the transfer of data. And I have said very uh, clearly in, here in Brussels and elsewhere that I think Safe Harbor is a deeply important tool for consumer protection and privacy. It is the hook that people like me and other folks who are focused on protecting U.S. citizens' privacy as well as Europeans' privacy, it is the hook that we have to, to offer greater protection. So I have said, please don't take it away from me. As a law enforcement official, I do not want any tools taken away. Now, having said that, Safe Harbor is 15 years old, and like any tool, it can be re-examined and um, in appropriate ways improved. And so we have been working with our colleagues at the Commerce Department, which is the entity that administers the program. We are the backstop enforcement entity, but the Commerce Department uh, administers it. The Commerce Department is leading the discussions with uh, DG Justice and others in the Commission over how Safe Harbor can be improved. And we've been working very closely with everyone to give our views in terms of how Safe Harbor can be improved. Look. The alternative dispute resolution fees, I think, is something that clearly needs to be addressed. Increased transparency around who's in safe harbor, who's out of safe harbor, uh, who's it clearly can be improved. Um, increased account accountability on the part of ensuring that those who are part of safe harbor are, are complying with its principles absolutely can be improved. But please don't take it away because I will and my agency will enforce it. And I think we've put our money where our mouth is. Just this week, we announced a very important uh, settlement involving an entity, trustee, that is, um, it did not um, involve its safe harbor um, compliance, but rather trustee is a very important part mm -hmm. of the entire self-regulatory program with, about, that concerns safe harbor. Trustee also has an incredibly important role with respect to children's uh, privacy. They also provide um, a SEAL and Safe Harbor program with respect to COPPA, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So we just announced a settlement involving trustee because we found that in a minority, a large minority of, of uh, cases, that is, a small, I, I should say a small minority of cases, they were not um, actually uh, appropriately recertifying the company, the entities. That's what we alleged. There was a settlement. We now have trustee under a 20-year order 
that's going to require additional reporting requirements. If that order is violated, there will, and we, and we prove a violation, there could be very significant penalties that, that will inure to, um, or inure against a trustee. But it isn't just the trustee case. We have brought now about 25 cases involving uh, safe harbor violations, including elements of the Google and Facebook settlement. So now, any case that we examine in the United States with respect to privacy or data security, we look at whether or not there is a potential safe harbor violation. So it's something that we at the FTC, FTC take tremendously seriously. What does the trustee settlement mean? I really hope that everyone here and everyone in Europe will take away the message, not that safe harbor is broken, therefore we had to bring the trustee case, but rather that safe harbor works and backstop enforcement by the FTC works. Because what we will do, look, it doesn't happen immediately. There are all sorts of due process rights in our justice system in the United States. So sometimes these cases are slower than people would like. But we will take these cases seriously, and in appropriate circumstances, we will bring an enforcement action, even against entities, whether it's Facebook or Google, or whether it's an, a key player like trustee, we will, in appropriate circumstances, bring enforcement actions. And I think that shows that the system works. Thank you very much, ladies. You were wonderful. Let me <laughs> One post-applause remark. Yes, I, I just wanted to say a few comments on the safe harbor. Because you imagine, of course. Do I get rebuttal time? <laughs> the last question was the most delicate one. Now, um, we don't only want improvement of the safe harbor. We want clear answers to the situation that has been created by the Snowden revelation. So the Commission has made 13 propositions. On these 13th proposition, and specifically the 13th one, the DPA, the European authorities, they are expecting real answers. So it's not a technical issue, you know, that has to be improved year by year. It's, there has been a kind of a confident crisis within Europe after the Snowden revelation. The safe harbor is one of the most important compliance tools between the two continents. So we need now to adapt these tools to the new situation. So we will be very vigilant on the output. And so I get a tiny rebuttal. <laughs> tiny. But I, there were, the Commission put forward 13 demands, requests, suggestions. 11 of them dealt with, were in, in my sphere and in, within the sphere of the Commerce Department, dealt with safe harbor as a, sort of an administrative tool and in the enforcement tool. And I was, you know, we are deeply involved in, in those 11. Isabel is absolutely right. There are two recommendations that are outside of my remit. Mm. And Frankly, I think actually outside of your remit and frankly outside of DG Justice's remit as it, you know, in, in a box. But I understand there's deep concern about these issues. I think that there has been a tremendous effort on the part of the national security folks in the United States to figure out how to appropriately respond. But it's not what I do. Um, but I do think that what you see in the United States through breathing great life into the PCLOB, the um, Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, through the chief privacy officers that we have throughout the uh, national security system, and through all sorts of mechanisms that we are starting to re-examine, whether it's the FISA court and various bills that are being examined and whatnot. I think there is a deep discussion in the United States, not only about how to deal with Europeans' concerns, but frankly how to deal with concerns of US citizens. This is a discussion that's deeply important and will continue. So I understand what Isabel is saying. I understand the linkage that has been made. But that is a conversation that um, I can watch 
but I, I am not competent to engage in. And I think the competent folks, the security folks, need to be a deep part of that conversation. Thank you very much.